When you open a terminal and enter a command, what actually happens under the hood to execute that command? The magic that happens behind a computer screen is surprisingly a complicated one. So today we're going to scratch the surface on how a terminal actually works from a technical standpoint. If you're new here, hey, we're Warp. We're dedicated to making the command line a more usable and powerful place for all developers. Let's go back over 60 years ago. Mac Studio. MacBook Air. The future. A card file, a notepad, a clock. The third industry milestone product, Macintosh. Has the computer made your life easier? Made it more fun. Revolution in technology. Required and working out the solution. New uses are found for computers. The modern terminal we see today is heavily inspired by teletype computers. These computers were made to allow people to send and receive text-based commands using a keyboard and printed output. In the 1960s, a lot of places that were able to afford these types of computing were structured with a large mainframe computer that had a physical attachment to a teletype interface. Here's how this technology worked. Every time you would click a character, it would transmit that over the wire. The kernel of the mainframe computer would receive this input and then decode it. This decoded text is sent to something called the TTY driver, which was responsible for sending the user's decoded input to programs and collecting output. This would then be sent back to the user for them to see. What made this really incredible was something called the line discipline. This would buffer the characters in memory and wouldn't send to the TTY driver until the enter button was pressed. Other optimizations were made along the way, like being able to edit something if you made a mistake or keyboard shortcuts. You can see how our modern day terminals are starting to look a little bit like the teletype. Now, 1970 unveiled incredible technology. The VT-05 all the way to the VT-100 introduced an all-in-one video terminal that can support anti-escape codes, colors, and sounds. This machine was revolutionary but still based on the same premise, input and output. Technology advanced, computers were no longer just machines to talk to larger machines. Operating systems were now developed and they were almost everywhere. Which brings us to today. Macintosh. Windows 95, new, different, better. I don't think it could be more black and white. The stuff is kind of cool. Software, AI, supercomputers. Computers are no longer just text, but rather a combination of intricate things moving all at once. So how did we go from a physical terminal, which is the only thing that a computer could do, to just an application? Terminal emulators. Just like all programs on your computer, the terminal is overseen by your operating system of choice. The terminal will listen for input from the user and tell the operating system what to display in the window. Now let's think historically for a second. If you were to draw out what I just said, this looks a lot like how an IBM 2741 would work. It is quite literally emulating terminal hardware. So how do we actually emulate? Before the terminal opens, the terminal creates a way to communicate with your shell, the shell being the software in the terminal that does the functionality. In the 1960s, this was a physical wire that would stream the characters. So what is the modern day wire connection? The wire is known as PTY or pseudo teletype which are pairs of file descriptors that represent a bridge that communicates between the terminal and the processes running with it. So the terminal asks the operating system to make the file pair. One end of the PTY is the leader. This is what the terminal uses to write the stuff you type into it and read the output that is shown back to you. On the other end is the follower. This is used by the shell and other tasks that the terminal starts. After the files are created, the terminal has one last critical task, spawning the shell, the brains of the operation. Each time you run a command, the shell runs a child process. The shell is the first child process of the terminal session. The terminal will create it and set it to read and write from the PTY follower. And now the shell is ready to go. So the shell is born and it runs some scripts to let the users customize their experience. Behavior is different depending on if you're using a computer that doesn't have a GUI experience like an Ubuntu server or a personal computer. It now prepares itself to accept user input, usually by printing something like the username, time, host name, etc. After this, it's ready for user input. When you enter a keystroke, the character you insert is translated into Unicode characters. These characters are written to the shell's line editor. Special characters like backspace or interrupt will trigger 
very special functions that will decide if it needs to write back to the leader. So when you hit backspace, the eraser character is triggered to edit its buffer by removing the last character and then writing the intent back to its leader. For non-special characters, the line discipline will write the character back to the leader. For better functionality, modern shells disable the line discipline's canonical features by putting it into raw mode so that the shell's line editor gets all the characters before the command is submitted and can help the user write their command with things like completions, auto suggestions, and even syntax highlighting. One character we haven't mentioned is NL, short for new line, which is used when hitting the enter key. In traditional terminals, the keys are sent over one by one while the enter confirms this. Modern terminals like warp keeps it all within the terminal and only sends over once enter is hit to provide extra functionality in the terminal itself. Once you hit enter, a lot happens. The shell has to parse the command by first tokenizing it and then analyzing it. To check if certain tokens are valid, it checks its sources, aliases, functions, environment variables, built-in commands, and path executables. Once it finds a source, for example, an executable, it locates it on the file system and executes it as a completely separate process as a child passing along any other arguments provided. When you run the ls command, it forks it to a child process and inherits the shell's file descriptors. All output from ls goes to the follower. The line discipline just passes the raw bytes straight to the leader. This is when the terminal emulator reads the stream and displays it to us. But this is just for plain white text. How about the colors that all terminals have? Escape sequences. Escape sequences are special codes embedded in the text output that instructs the terminal how to display text. They look like this. The terminal will see these codes and then decide how to render the text accordingly. Early terminals were really simple, but as they advanced, more features like colors, cursors, and more were added, which brought the ANSI X364 standard for basic control. This made it easier for developers to work with the terminal. When you finish your terminal session and close your terminal window, a lot actually happens behind the scenes before the shell actually quits. The shell performs cleanup steps like saving command history, running logout scripts, and exiting any active sessions. Any child processes spawned by the shell are killed. Resources like open file descriptors are freed up. After cleanup, the shell processes exit and tells the terminal emulator to close up as well. The operating system cleans up any remaining sources used by the shell and terminal processes. With the shell and terminal processes terminated and resources freed, the terminal window closes fully, and your session is logged out and cleaned up completely at this point. All of this happens in a matter of seconds. What I find really interesting about all of this is how deceptive the terminal is from an outside perspective perspective. Writing a command to an old computer made sense back in the day. It was literally the easiest way to communicate with a computer. And moving to today, it's interesting to see that this is still the most straightforward way to talk to a computer, even though we know it requires so many complex steps. All right, thank you for watching today's video. If you are interested in learning how to boost your productivity by setting up your Mac terminal, we have a video here that you can check out.